Do you blue? Oh, there you go. Click. And we're live. It is Friday, August 19th, 5.02 p.m. in the year of our Lord, 2022. And a magical thing has happened. Uh, Kate has cut her hair, um, which uh, hadn't really happened for the entirety of the pandemic. And yeah. actually... And actually, if you go back to the original episode of In Lieu of Fun, you will find that Kate's hair is about the same length as Mike Pesca's hair is now, yeah. uh, which is to say <laughs> millimeters is the, yeah. or micrometers is the appropriate. It was, uh, but it has grown with the show. It was and, like grown to here. Yeah, it was getting long. And then now it is... Uh, uh, still, I think measured in centimeters would be, we're not at micrometers yet, but tell us the story. Did you do it? We want to know, first of all, why didn't you do it on the show? And secondly, <laughs> did you do it in the traditional in lieu of fun fashion with a hedge trimmer? Um, there are no hedge trimmers involved, but that's really just because they're on back order at from Amazon right now, like everything else in the world. Um, but uh, I'm pretty, yeah, it was the war with Ukraine has like got all these supply chains mixed up. I don't know if you guys have heard about this, that whole mm -hmm. conflict at all. Um, but no, the, um, uh, no, it's not that big a deal. I, uh, I decided it's very, it's like hot-ish here. It's not as hot as it was. I don't know. I just, uh, the, the hair thing, I've never cared about hair. I've said this before. I don't give a, I just don't care about my hair. I thought about getting it actually cut and like go. And so I called last night. I just felt like getting it cut for the first time in two and a half years. And I called a hair salon that's like a block away from me. And they were like, that will be $110 if you want your hair cut. And I was like, thanks, Joe Biden. Um, <laughs> and so, <laughs> uh, and so then I Googled uh, how to cut your own hair and I put it in a ponytail and I chopped it off and then I took a shower and then I just like trimmed up all the little bits and it's still like horribly uneven. Like there's this like random piece right here. I don't know, whatever. I just don't care because I don't, I don't care about hair. So yeah, um, yeah. so that's- You, you have that's, hair yeah. privilege, Kate. I know. So, I know. So many of us would like to be able to not care. Yeah. So I had one of these. I realized that at this moment, where I have a friend who will go unnamed, who has been struggling with hair loss since he was like in high school. Like he was like one of these guy, kid, like guys that was like started taking Rogaine at like twenty one and was like obsessed with it. And I was like, we've been friends for years and years, and. Uh, we were at like a wedding together with a friend, a male friend who has like the best hair. Like he just has like, it's like, it's just like a silvery gray and it just, there's so much of it. And it's like long and he's like, you know, 40 in his forties and just like has all of this hair. And my friend looked at me, my friend, uh, Dave looked at me and goes, I would pay a hundred thousand dollars for that hair. Like he just was like, and I was literally just like, I just never occurred to me like that he, and he was like, you know, so after 20 years of trying to like keep his hair from like falling out, he was like, I would pay a hundred thousand dollars. And then it reminded me of that really great Simpsons episode where when Homer gets a beautiful, when Homer hair. gets, um, what's his name's hair, the criminal, um, oh my God. I wanted to say Sideshow Bob, but it's like the same. It's not. It's the. Is it Sideshow Mel? No, it was that. It was like the um, it was like the the guy with like the heart tattoo and he has like the Elvis hair. But anyways, that oh, was snake. Yeah. Snake. That's right. Yeah. He gets right. snakes hair. Do you remember? And it like turns him evil. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so I do think not having good hair or hair at all. It's not the impediment it once was. Uh, back in, you know, all the way through the 90s when people had that male pattern baldness and just lived with it, it did oh, denote a lack of it. Yeah, it it was something to uh, it did denote, I think, a squirreliness. I think it did denote uh, untrustworthiness. Uh, if you saw the uh, breaking, if you saw Better Call Saul, 
the defense lawyer he hires has that bad comb over hair. And it does preclude you from, say, becoming an anchor man. Or if you look at most senators, they have better hair than the average, the average human male of their age. And I do think that people look at that sort of hairlessness with suspicion. All of which is a seven minute long way of saying that we are not allowed that we are not allowed to have fun anymore. Uh, and Kate is not allowed to have hair anymore. And Mike was never allowed to have hair. <laughs> but we are allowed to have Mike Pesca back on in lieu of fun at last to talk about how not to be horrible. So oh, wait, wait, wait. Can we, before we get into how not to be horrible, can I ask Mike what he thinks about Brittany Griner? Yeah, um, I think that at first I, I, it was very perplexing that someone of her, what I perceived to be stardom, which really m- might have been elevated. You had a mind. really great, you had a really great monologue about this on the gist, like or yeah. Like, yeah. This is someone who is the equivalent, and then I named three or four male basketball players, so not quite LeBron, but you know, right under that level of greatness. WNBA is not as popular as NBA. And I knew that it was a um, tactic not to have a lot of publicity about her. I don't know what the tactic bought us. I, a friend of mine named Ethan Strauss has an interesting uh, podcast in Substack. And his theory is that we're being told to care more about Brittany Griner than a couple of Paul Whelan or a couple of the other detainees for reasons that he thinks that that he resents and he thinks the public resents. I don't know. I talked to my wife about this who never heard of Brittany Griner beforehand, and she just feels so horrible. And uh, yeah, I don't know exactly what uh, Russia's game is. I find it interesting that Iman Shumpert, an NBA player, is recently busted in the Dallas airport for having marijuana. So each, you know, municipality can enforce its marijuana laws. I, I suppose that Russia is doing it way too harshly and also probably, you know, as a stratagem on the international stage. I, th- I also think that, oh, and I also have interviewed the guy who, a very good biographer, Paul Farhi. Do you know him from the Post? He kind of went into just this kind of, um, you know, international research, but beforehand or maybe uh, at the same time, he did a great biography of Victor Boot, who is the uh, guy, the merchant of death that they're going to swap him for. I think it would be a fine swap. Boots only in a U.S. jail because he agreed to do business with the FARC, but he never actually did business with the FARC. And that was a trap because doing business with a FARC, they're a designated U.S. terrorist organization, whereas everyone else he flew guns to wasn't. And there was another, sorry to go on for so long, but there was another detainee swap from a guy who was in a uh, Connecticut jail for years and years and years. And I even felt sorry for that Russian guy. It just seemed like he was doing what he did and he's a generally amoral person. But it wasn't really against the law until a United States agent entrapped him in the law, probably not the correct legal analysis, but dangled a deal in front of him that would have violated U.S. laws. I don't think anyone becomes less safe if Victor Boot goes back to Russia. I really don't. All right. I just want to say marijuana, drug law enforcement generally sucks, but when it's done... uh, in order to take hostages, it particularly sucks. Yeah, uh, I just Mike is like the only one of the only people give like a full throated like kind of treatment of this and discuss it on the show. And like, I just thought like, and I was like, when I was listening to it and catching up on episodes a couple of weeks ago, I was like, how is there like this is the first time in all of the things I listen to or read or like whatever that like I'm hearing someone be so dismayed about this for all of the reasons Mike just said. And I just think that it's super interesting. So as things have happened, I've just been like very curious what Mike's take was. So thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. Yeah. All of which brings us to being horrible. So a number of uh, uh, a couple of years ago now, maybe more, because uh, the gist was on hiatus for a while. Mike did a monologue, might have been more than one monologue, about the standard of not being horrible. And um, uh, before we go any farther, I have to ask you, horrible or horrible? 
<laughs> I'm probably, let's say, I'll have to say it just a series of horrible events. That's how I say it. Horrible. Yeah. Because I think there's a, you know, the never the twain shall meet yeah. between the people who say horrible and the people who say horrible. Right. Um, this is this is horrible like orange and, juice, I guess is how it would go. Horrible. I'm, I'm horrible very much orange. in the horrible department. Um, anyway, um, the gist of the monologue, if I can, uh, the gist of the spiel, if I can be so bold, was that the um, a good standard of conduct is, would it be horrible to do X? And if the answer is yes, then you probably don't want to do X. And it was set up as a political standard, but I think I was reminded of it the other day because somebody asked on the show um, uh, uh, what the what the norms what norms we would propagate, and I said, "Don't be an asshole," which is kind of similar to "Don't be horrible." So I was thinking, it was kind of on my mind, and then Wednesday or Tuesday or Thursday or one of those days, Mike did a uh, another monologue about high conflict um, mm -hmm. and uh, invoking uh, the great Amanda Ripley uh, book, which I still have not read, um, about uh, uh, escalating and de-escalating of high conflict. Uh, which kind of is a similar theme. And so I thought we should uh, discuss this shit. And so I'm just going to turn the floor over to you, Mike, and you can you can do a spiel. You can repeat your spiel. You can do a, uh, uh, a provocation. You can do something horrible uh, and to see how we react. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Don't Be Horrible originally started with the North Carolina bathroom bills, and I thought this was not a very hard subject to parse. Not only were all of my inclinations at the time on the side of the people who might want to use the bathroom that they felt would not get them attacked, for instance, uh, I also thought all the, all the opposition arguments just didn't carry any water. So I articulated a standard of just don't be horrible. If you're wondering, well, you know, are they, should they really be using these bathrooms? And what if there is someone in the bathroom of a different gender? Well, what's the horrible thing to do? The horrible thing to do would be to tell someone who feels uncomfortable using the men's room that they have to use the men's room. That's a horrible thing. Um, since then, I think especially on that, I was saying to myself, the standards maybe have changed a little. And so I don't know what the don't be horrible stance is with uh, Leah Thomas, right? It would it be horrible to say you can't swim. That seems pretty unfair to the women who were swimmers. Fina articulated a tension between justice and fairness, which I thought was pretty interesting. You know, a saying essentially maybe justice is to allow Leah Thomas to swim against women. Maybe fairness isn't. It's something to think about. I don't know what horrible is, but just in the last couple of days, again, with the issue of gender, there was a girls, a girls volleyball tournament in the state of Utah. And one of the teams thought that, or one of the parents of one of the players, a losing player, thought that someone on the other team might be transgender or might be a different gender than the uh, than she's playing as on the girls volleyball team. So at that point, even if that's your suspicion, what would the horrible thing be? And the horrible thing would be what they did, which is to pursue proof that she wasn't a girl and the proof was not forthcoming ever since she was in kindergarten. She's always been registered as a girl. And thankfully, the state commission didn't want to take it any further into something like genital inspection. These days, though, I do think, and uh, South Park had a, had a, uh, a segment on this, a, an episode, that tolerance used to be an ideal. And now tolerance gets poked a little. It's not enough to be tolerant. You have to take a stance on one side or another. And sometimes I think stances are right, but I don't know if you always have to take a stance. So, you know, if you look at, for instance, during the Black Lives Matter protests, the poetry organization that put out mm, a message of support, that was not horrible. It would be perhaps horrible not to support Black Lives Matter, but it wasn't good enough and it led to mass firings within their ranks. So ethically speaking, I would at least say that Don't Be Horrible didn't carry the day in that circumstance. That's, uh, that's Don't Be Horrible. I'd love to get into civil wars and right-wing militias, but I would like to also cede the floor back to you guys. What do you think? 
I love the don't be horrible standard. I think the- How is it I, so different from don't be an a, no assholes? Oh, I think it's a very similar standard to the okay. no assholes rule, which is a explicit policy at lawfare. Um, and I think the, um, uh, now it's, the, the, the difference is that it is possible to be an asshole without being horrible. Uh, the no assholes rule is a little bit more about, you know, don't be a prickly jerk when we're trying to work together, right? It's about, it's like, it's something short of horrible, right? It's like, be a pleasant person to work with. Be, don't be the person who's always, you know, making things less pleasant. I think don't be horrible or don't be horrible is uh, is more about humanity, actually, and less about manner. I mean, if you're if you've decided that your life ambition is to regulate which bathroom people use, it's it's a little bit more than, you know, being an asshole. It's so I, I, I would say don't be don't be horrible is the political expression of the interpersonal don't be an asshole rule. But because politics magnifies everything, it probably, uh, it, it, the stakes are generally higher. Mike, you bring up like a really interesting point though about tolerance. Can we actually talk about this more? Because like, right, like I feel as if like just being tolerant was... I don't know. It was like how I was kind of like, I don't know. It was like how I was kind of like raised. Like, yes, yes. It was an ideal to shoot for, right? Yes. Yeah. Like, of course, there was like the obvious paradox of tolerance, right? Which is like, how is a person going to be the paradox of tolerance being like, if you're tolerant of intolerance, then like, how, like, where does that leave you? Like, are you tolerant of everything, including people who are tolerant of nothing and like type of thing? And like, where do you, and then I think you get to this point of like where you decide to take a stand. But like, I just kind of, I'm like, don't be horrible seems as if like, it is the political equivalent of some type of, of kind of like, it, it kind of depends on the stakes, mm -hmm. right? Like it's like, it's like, the, it's like, it's about like what it's all like, you know, it's not just like, like there's a reason that like we care less about Leah Tom, 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 Thompson, Thompson, Thomas, I can't remember, um, being able to swim competitively in like the Ivy League where she's not even going to like go to the Olympics or do whatever. Like that can be a whole thing, but also the stakes are like low com comparably, right? Except that people see her as some type of like trial balloon for future conflicts around that do matter in this realm, right? And so I feel like the same was true with bathrooms and gay marriage. And like all of these kinds of things is that you have the Rick Santorums out there saying, it's a slippery slope. If you let gay people marry, then they're going to marry their cats and dogs or like whatever it was that he used to say. And it was like just absolutely awful. But like that is, I guess, one of the like the counters to like, don't be horrible. It's like, well, I don't care who uses my bathroom, but maybe I care like who is allowed to compete in the Olympics for whatever reason. I, I still think yeah. that should qualify as don't be horrible, but you see what I'm saying? Yes. So I think a good example of maybe the tensions of don't be horrible is in the, let's keep it at the University of Pennsylvania's home city, Philadelphia. There the gay rights parade kind of fell apart over the inclusion of police. In other cities, including police in the gay rights parade caused problems, but they were solved. Some cities didn't allow it. San Francisco had a workable solution. So what's the horrible thing there? I, I suppose to many people who are marching the gay rights parade who didn't want the police, horrible would, to, would be allowing the police, a symbol of oppression historically to gay communities. To other people like the police or the people who were 
at least, let's say, tolerant of the police. The horrible thing would be to exclude uh, gay police officers who have done nothing but try to help either reform the police's way or the police in the gay community. I don't know how much, I guess, it helps you. And so then maybe it gets back to it's just a, a self-congratulating way to say um, we have identified the people that we all knew is are horrible and are calling them that in a more rigorous way. No, I don't think so. I think it's doing a little bit more work than that. And to say that there are some problems it will not solve um, is not to dismiss it as a standard. So let's take a contemporary uh, issue uh, that is not uh, uh, gender identification, abortion. Yeah. Um, now, I think most people would say, hey, state X decided to uh, respond to um, uh, Dobbs by uh, moving the gestational deadline two weeks earlier. Um, and they would say, I may agree with that policy. I may disagree with that policy. Um, it's going to affect relatively few people. Uh, it's bad. I don't like it. Um, but you would have a, a quite reasonable debate among a large number of people as to whether that's horrible or whether that's policy. But then you say a 16-year-old girl in Florida the other day was denied uh, the ability to have an abortion by a state appellate court because they ruled that she was not mature enough to, this is not a joke, uh, not mature enough to make that decision, but, uh, and therefore by default is mature enough to have a baby and be forced to have a baby. Um, now little lady, and that's you, a pretty big decision for a gal like you. Right, yeah. and so I, I, I think you could probably get 80% agreement that that's horrible. Um, and so, it, look, it's not going to answer all the questions, but the don't be horrible standard uh, actually does, and like when you can get large number of people to agree, ah, that's terrible. Um, uh, I think it answers the questions that it does answer in a fairly elegant fashion. Yeah, that's a good, I mean, that's a great point. Like, what's the horrible outcome? Sure. For a percentage of anti um, or pro-life people, just any abortion under any circumstances, and this is why they want no rape or incest exceptions. But then when it happens to the 10-year-old in Ohio or the girl you're talking about, 80% of the people will jump to, well, what's the most, it's so much more horrible to make her have the baby. It's much, much, much more horrible, no matter how horrible. Right. So what is the least harm that is to be done and it is to allow that child to have the abortion? And so I, I guess I think the, the, if we could all agree that when there's a kind of consensus, hey, that's what you're doing is horrible. We don't do that. Um, yeah. That could actually be the basis of, um, and now the, I think the bigger problem with the standard, honestly, is that to go back to the bathroom example, that people actually don't agree about, you know, when when North Carolina says that my son must use the girl's bathroom because he's biologically female at birth, um, I think a lot of people don't think that's horrible. Now, that's because they don't know any trans people. Um, and you know, and they they have a kind of what's the big deal uh, uh, and they have a kind of genital determinism uh, view of the world. Um, but I think the more people actually interact with trans people, the more they will, they actually just fall naturally into the, that's kind of barbaric to require, you know, a trans male to use the girl's bathroom, uh, particularly in a high school. Um, and I think that just like, just as now, which was not true 15 years ago, uh, you know, 
even conservatives who are very high on Dobbs hasten to say, of course, we're not going to do anything like this with, with, uh, you know, uh, overturning uh, uh, the gay marriage decision because, you know, that would be horrible. Um, and, I, you know, I think there's a, there's a, uh, there's a, people have kind of gotten used to the idea of gay equality in a way that people have not yet gotten used to the idea that gender is a bit more fluid than we, than we like to think sometimes. Yes. I also think that the idea of don't be horrible, if we really let it guide us, it's more of a do least harm ethos. And I think especially we as Americans don't subscribe to that, probably states with a better safety net or Scandinavian countries or even just smaller countries where they really see each other as real people, maybe ethnic kin. But, you know, just look at ranked choice voting, right? What ranked choice voting really does is a way to organize ourselves so we don't pick the, the most bad person. But what the regular way of voting uh, does is we allow people, we allow the person who the most people want the most to win. It's just a different way of ordering a society. We're more, we're more winner oriented than, you know, loser or um, harm uh, abatement oriented, I think. Yeah, I think that that's exactly right. This is kind of, this is kind of why I was like, I think the stakes matter in horribleness like i think that like because it is about like a harm kind of it is about harm and i don't know that's a really interesting follow through though mike about the ranked choice voting that is like a really great way of putting it it is like a pot it's like the least bad like i mean there's like it's like that old adage about consensus which is like no, like, you know, you've reached a good consensus when nobody's happy. Like, I kind of feel as if, like, that but is right the right. Taliban by that yeah, measure. Exactly. Doesn't the Taliban <laughs> achieve consensus? Um, so, wait, you know I, 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 I just I, I, I want to okay. wait, wait, before you throw this out there, I want to throw something else out there that there's something else elegant about this the don't be horrible standard, which is that there are very few standards, ethical and moral standards that apply equally well to policy making and individual conduct. And uh, the night one of the nice things about the don't be horrible standard is that it it works kind of as an individual guide to behavior as well as to a social guide to policy behavior. Um, and I think that's actually not true of like, you know, neither a borrower nor a lender be right like which is clearly not true of the u.s federal government right we we all agree that the u.s government should be borrowing um uh there's all kinds of uh areas where it's actually hard to articulate uh policy standards that apply to individuals uh, or individual standards that apply well to policy, but don't be horrible kind of works. Yeah. I think for, you know, the incentives in media and politics are the opposite though. Say the outrageous thing, the don't be horrible candidate will, if his or her constituents um, follow along, might like the person after 20 years in office, but they're never going to get a lot of attention. They're never going to stand out. It's very hard to campaign on. I am the a candidate candidate of unhorribleness. I mean, Biden tried to do it because there was such a strong contrast last time. But in general, that's not going to generate headlines. I don't know. I think that if you look at Pennsylvania, if you look at um, uh, uh, um, uh, Georgia, that there is a horrible candidate. Right. and a kind of proudly horrible candidate and then there's a i'm just a normal sane person who's not horrible candidate um and i think it works pretty well i mean there's a whole horrible slate of candidates in arizona they, they actually have a ticket um, and <laughs> what what unites the other side 
it's, they're, they're not horrible. They're not they're not going to overturn democratic choice because that would be horrible. They're going to certify an election that results that's accurate because not doing that that would be horrible. Um, I think it's kind of a not horrible is is underrated. Yeah, but you know, in Gosar and Marjorie Taylor Greene and Bobert's district, that doesn't work. And hey, I mean, the horrible caucus is going to exist. It's just a question of whether we can control its size. It's just such a, I have this, well, the horrible caucus existing is like, I think a little bit proof that like, not be, don't be horrible is just like not a particularly useful platform. I mean, like, what do you actually think that like, what if like you presented this idea? to like Marjorie Taylor Greene. Like, just don't be horrible, lady. Just stop being horrible. Like, what the hell would she say? Like, it's I easy don't... to say now that our rights are on the line and if we don't win the next election, where all our freedoms are gonna be taken from us in 1776 and Alex Jones. There was like- right. in other words, she would say- way more articulate. My, she would say, like... <laughs> in other yeah. words, she would say, no, I like being horrible. And I think that's a that's a good contrast. No, but this is like a little bit, this is a little bit where it's like, I think that there is something, I think that this is like, this has like a limited, I mean, it's obviously kind of a goofy and like norm, like norm based idea of like kind of horrible or not horrible. Um, it's like whatever you think that word means or whatever you think it defines it. But like, I do, I do really kind of wonder to Mike's bigger point, which is like, why do people tip over into deciding not to be tolerant anymore and to instead like decide that they're going to be horrible? And I don't even just mean this on like political issues. So like I was at the gas station a couple of months, like a month ago, like returning a rental car, which was a van. Hi, David Boss. Um, and uh, and returning event, and there was this guy that came up, and his entire Mercedes like SUV was filled with speakers that were blasting music so loud that like literally the gas station like like caught like whatever it was was like pump was like trembling and i just like looked at him and like kind of made that look like you fucking asshole like thanks a lot for like you know involuntarily like giving me like a hearing problem um and he just started screaming at me like screaming at me like i have more money than you i have so much more money than you this and you're driving your fucking van and i've got this fifty thousand dollar speaker set and this is worth more than all of you and i'm like okay <laughs> and like you know, like just like kind of coming at me and i'm like about to go zoolander on this guy with like my gas like my gas nozzle like just cover him in gasoline if he keeps like coming at me and he is just like f-bombing and like doing everything and i'm just like i mean he is just so angry mike like and i'm kind of like sitting here thinking like He's violating the don't be horrible rule. Yeah. Well, right, but he is, but like, why? Like, but there is something, but like, what I guess, what I'm really curious about is like, what is it that makes some people want to be horrible? Like, doesn't, and doesn't he know that the car rental place is where Kate Klein's powers are at their highest? I doesn't know. he know <laughs> not to fuck with you I at know. the car rental place? I mean, I like legitimately felt like I was like, I had like, it was kind of like, I had like, it was like, play, it was like poker or like some type of video game where you know that you have like all of these extra hearts that are like mm. waiting in the wings and you're just like, yeah, you're, you know, but my, but anyways, I just kind of sat there and it's like, uh-huh. And, but like, I, but I mean, this happens to, every, I mean, everyone has one of these stories. Like they come into contact with someone who is so hostile and just so angry and so whatever. But I feel like the, uh, like the, I feel like it's gotten worse. And I feel like people are maybe it's worse because there are people out there 
that do this for a living now. Like they're horrible to people literally for a living, like Marjorie Taylor Greene. And so I there just is- I want to point out that Kate is solidly in the horrible camp. Wait, it's a pronunciation. What? Oh, am I? I didn't even notice. I can't Yeah, you're- this. Mike is more in the horrible camp and horrible. we're in the horrible camp. Yeah, well, that's Mike and I grew up in different parts of the country. But there's like, anyways, but- he, I mean, like, but right, like, so there's like, no. I guess my point is, is like, there are some people who are just like, so angry. And so, and like, there's so like, we've talked, we were, we're adding all this logic to this idea. We've like got the harm principle in there. We've got like, the degree of harm, we've got the slippery slope analysis. But like, what about people that just like being horrible? Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's in, increased. I think that there is a correlation between the whole death, deaths of despair thing. I think that you're lucky you're doing this return in New York and not a place where there would have been gun racks on the back of the truck along with- I totally agree with that. Yeah. I mean, I like, there was nothing to make me- When something like that happens, I look around see if John Quinones is there doing a, uh, what would you do segment? I think I'm getting punked. I know, I know. Um, it just, but like, I, I don't know, like, they're just kind of just like, this again brings us to the paradox of intolerance, which is like, mm. what if you're a tolerant person, what do you do with a person like that? That just screams, yeah. I mean, I guess you take it. Could I, oh, we could go to David, but could I get into my, uh, my spiel, if you will, about high conflict and right wing malicious? Oh, absolutely. Please. Let's make David disappear <laughs> I can and, no. and He'll bring be back. Alaric up because Alaric's question was about this. So he will set up this spiel beautifully. Cool. I was I was worried my question was kind of tenuous. But um, listening to the gist as I do, I know you really advocate against uh, catastrophizing. There's a lot of it going on. And so I was going to ask, you know, how that sort of dovetails with horribleness. Yeah. Funny you should ask, <laughs> Mike. <laughs> yeah, I do think that um, it's very hard and they're all gray areas. So what I was talking about on the gist, what I've been talking about for the last few days, just because I think it's a point not being made, is looking after the, um, after the warrants were served on Mar-a-Lago, um, the outburst of anger and threats from the right. And let's just say, and let's just stipulate, there is an absolute horrible problem of armed right-wing people who have violence in their heart and because they have guns in their closets or stored less safely, they have the means to execute the violence. They go on TikTok, they talk about being violent. We know the Proud Boys exist. We know the Oath Keepers exist. We know there's a whole lot of violent ideation on the right. However, I do think that if we wanted to, and by we, I mean us who think and media who tells a story, if we wanted to tell a scary story about a whole lot of other people within our society, we could, but we know not to. When we tell the scary story about people on the right, it's not irresponsible per se. These people, absolutely, many of these people do want to harm us. However, what are the chances of us actually being harmed and how much pleasure or how much um, security do we feel because we get to point the finger at other bad people and say, not only are they terrible, but their leaders are causing a phrase that's uh, popping up more and more. Their leaders are causing stochastic terrorism. So my idea, and I go back to Amanda Ripley's book of high conflict, I think what's happening is that there is real violent anger on the right. And then the left reacts to this anger and it is disproportionate on the right. It's not totally on the right. Roll Call did a survey of people in Congress and they found that 70% of Democrats said they got death. Nope, 70 total Democrats said they got death threats and 50-ish Republicans said they got death threats. So it's not proportional. And three out of four people who've been arrested um, by the FBI or federal authorities for threatening a federal official, have threatened Democratic federal officials. This is all true. However, uh, when, when the left receives these stories and they hear stories about how much the right wants to kill them, the left responds in kind with everything from suspicion to aggression of their own. And then when the right elements of the right 
tell the stories about what the left is thinking and how much they hate these people on the right and how violent they think they are, the right gets further aggrieved. So it's this never ending cycle. And what I was talking about on the show, for instance, I said, after this came out of the raid, um, Marcy Wheeler and others said, someone is going to get killed. And it turns out that a guy did attack the FBI office in Cincinnati with carpentry tools, and then he led him on a chase, and he was the one who got shot and killed. Like Ashley Babbitt was the one who got killed. Like many of these sovereign citizens are the ones who got killed. If you wanted to say what this, what these threats of right-wing violence are going to result in is death of right-wing militia members, that would be more accurate than predicting the death of regular citizens. It, uh, I think it's an extremely bad development in American public life that a recent poll from UC Irvine, and I have problems with the poll and the person who took it, but shows that 50% of Americans said we're headed for a civil war. How do you define civil war? What does that really mean? But the reason that 50% think it is because there's this high conflict cycle of th actual threat, perception of threat, and counter threat. If we wanted to say, you know what the most difficult and dangerous thing in America is right now? Well, it's clearly militant Iranians. There was a Brooklyn journalist who was stalked outside her house, who's an Iranian dissident, and they arrested a guy with an AK-47. Salman Rushdie was attacked and almost killed by someone who was guided by a fatwa. John Bolton, there was a there was a plan to kill a former administration official as executed by the Iranians. There was, and this doesn't exactly dovetail in, but there was anti-Muslim murders in Albuquerque. And if this fear of Iranians was in the air, we would light upon that and say, here's another example of it making us unsafe. We do that, that would be irresponsible. I'm glad we don't do that, but we do a thing like that with right-wing militias. And I think for the most part, they're dangerous and disturbing that anyone would think this, but, and I'm, I'm not saying don't take them seriously as a, a threat. I'm saying in your threat matrix, in your, our, all of our threat matrices, let not, let's not put them so high that it becomes this escalation of violence and us convincing ourselves that a civil war is not. I think that that's right. Can I, this reminded me of something been this whole conversation is reminding me remember when dan byman came on to talk about his book ben indeed yeah yes so dan byman is a colleague of ben's at brookings and is brilliant and wrote this great book about hate um and uh, spreading hate is the name of the book and um it's very good um and one of the things that i asked him and i think i like kind of framed this poorly but like one of my things about this is kind of related to like the exact question that like is coming up now which is like who like if you are a person on the right or if you are a person that is doing like if you are the person driving the fifty thousand dollars worth of audio equipment around in your car just to like literally be a roving nuisance on like everyone in new york city with their windows open like literally like what like you don't you don't think about what you're doing as hate you don't think about it as horrible what do you think about it as and this is kind of like what i kind of, this is why i kind of wanted you to like say what marjorie taylor green would say if you told her to just like stop be hor being horrible lately like like do people like we have this like flat term for all of these like kind of people who like espouse hate or do whatever but like i don't imagine that actually in these meetings and i know this from like reading kathleen blue's work and like others like they don't sit there in these meetings like of the kkk or neo-nazis and like necessarily espouse hate they actually are usually promoting some other type of like positive vibe or something else that they but like but the but the but the action of it yeah. is to be incredibly hateful or incredibly horrible to other people and so like what I guess I'm trying to say is like, how, how does like, no one like what, and this was my question for Dan, which is like, okay, like spreading hate is like your whole book is about hate, but like, what do they call it? Like, what do they call what they're doing? They're, they're stalwarts trying to defend uh, the American way of life. And they think that they're beset by enemies from within and without. And I would say the left thinks so too. And therefore they have to stand firm. 
Uh, and a lot of the stuff on TikTok, I'm not talking about the groups that actually are the Oath Keepers and think about the phrase, the Oath Keepers, they're stalwart, they're um, resilient. But many of those people on TikTok are just doing in-group signaling, right? They might know it, not know it, but they see someone put out a video about how the Civil War is coming. And so they have to put out an even more scary video where they wave their guns around and have longer beards and say the Civil War is coming. And I just advocate taking the temperature down and reporting on these people with, you know, uh, the actual amount of uh, killings from white right wing militias fail pale in comparison to, I won't call them left wing militias, but people motivated to kill law enforcement because they hate law enforcement from more of a left wing perspective, if we had to put a political ideology on it. David Botts, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. Good afternoon. It's really great to see all of you, all three of you. It's just fabulous to see all of you. Um, if you get a chance to check out, uh, it is episode, episode two of season two, Simpson and Delilah, where Homer, through insurance fraud, gets a hold of uh, its uh, demox demoxinil, which is almost like minoxinil. Uh, and, and his life is great until he spills it, and then he's sad. Then he, he's reduced back to Homer. But anyway, um, Mike, if it, I know you like, or I believe that you like to engage with people who don't literally agree with you on everything, because you, you like to, you know, get get poked and pushed a little bit. So if somebody asks you a question or disagrees with you on social media, what is your framework or process for determining whether or not or how to engage? Like, like, are they just, are they just grieving you? Just grievers? Are they, are they sincere? Are they coming at it uh, sincerely or it, talk us through your process, please? Yeah. If they, if they follow me, if I recognize the person, if they follow me, I'll never, snap back at them. I try not to snap back at most people. I've been finding Twitter more and more useless these days. Twitter is for dunking. Twitter is for owns, as Elizabeth Brunig says. It is true. And so, it, you know, I'm like forever less incentivized to get into it with anyone on Twitter. Uh, I like disagreements in person and I like to facilitate disagreements. Recently on the show, I had uh, two opposing views on neurodiversity and they weren't, they didn't disagree enough. They were so nice in person. I mean, I want to be nice, but I want also to say, no, that thing that you're saying is a thing I disagree with. And eventually I push them there. So I, you know, social media strategy is mostly avoided at all costs. I had a great exchange the other day with Jeffrey Clark, which is my first uh, uh, exchange with anyone who's ever engaged in a coup. Um, and uh, I was, uh, a cat. what's that? Nothing. Go ahead. Uh, and I was very pleased with it. I, I thought, um, uh, he was appropriately hostile and, and unpleasant and, um, and I was cheerful about it. So I enjoyed my, uh, my Twitter exchange with Jeff Clark a great deal. And, um, I plan to re-up it on the day of his indictment. Um, um, I'm just going to say that, like, just because they're nice to you on social media doesn't mean that they're not horrible. <gasps> I love this cat so much. This is different oh, from the last one. Oh, oh. Sorry. I, I like sometimes it. feel guilty about liking, not literally liking, but really getting enjoyment out of people who are caustic on social media. My number one person in that category is Ken White, the Pope hat. Hmm. He really lets them have it. And mostly I agree with Ken, but man, he's not elevating the discourse. <laughs> yeah, so I I am only mean to one person on social media, and, Rick that's, uh, and that's Rick Grinnell. <laughs> and I just consider that a sacred obligation um, uh, because he tried to turn an innocent exchange between me and Matteo, who's here in the Greek chorus, and Paula, uh, who's normally here in the Greek chorus, but I haven't seen her today, into a creepy thing where I was, uh, uh, you know, talking about foot pics with, with, you know, kids. 
And I thought that was beyond the pale. So I try to send him foot pics on get other people to do that. And uh, I just think that's the only rational way to respond to that sort of thing. Dr. Doom, the floor is yours. Hi, I, uh, nice, nice to be on. Uh, I just had an observation and I wanted to ask, in, instead of just consensus, what are the objective attributes of horribleness? Uh, I, I have an opinion that uh, humiliation of people has an awful lot to do with what's going on and uh, finding a way to reduce a sense of humiliation. Even people that you might find deplorable would be a good idea. Yeah, taking pleasure in the suffering of others. Yeah, punching down. Pun what punching, do you think? that's subjective. <laughs> yeah, but like there isn't much objective about horribleness. Right, like it's entirely subjective, right? Like. You no, but I, th I think there is an objective standard, actually. The objective standard is not an objective standard of horribleness. It's what percent of people would describe it as horrible. It's kind of like the first derivative of horribleness. Um, so we can't really define horribleness. But if I say to you, um, uh, you know, eating babies, you would say that's horrible. And so would Mike, and so would everybody in the Greek chorus. And so there's some threshold of agreement about horribleness that is a kind of useful proxy for horribleness. But then you get to the question of what about, you know, about your own group and the groups that you're in. And when you have two groups yeah. who are, or people, representatives from different groups who are scraping and chafing against each other. Speaking mm. of scraping and chasing, what is going on? Oh my God! Did, does you know, this always happen? Yeah, usually like... with the usually with his sister. So the other the other thing I would say is, you know, don't be assholes. I would say good rule, but it can't be the only rule. I worked at a place which had a no assholes rule, and at some point, uh, it was between me and another person. And I turned to my wife and I said, you know, this don't be assholes rule. I I am pretty sure this workplace has violated it because one of us is definitely an asshole. I don't know if it's me. <laughs> I don't know if it's him, but there's someone who's an asshole. But and don't be like, assholes is not enough to navigate, yes. navigate all these um, potential frictions. So that's why I got to have some rules. But this is exactly my point. Horribleness and assholishness are completely subjective terms. This is like completely subjective. And like what you just said about different groups is like basically the idea that a community defines norms and then like the norms are like whatever the community says. But if you change the construction of the like community, no one is going to agree on these types of things. And so I, I think that like this is why am I the asshole is like such an endlessly fascinating like reddit <laughs> like reddit thread because it is literally people like putting these things out there for a very diverse no one knows what communities that they're in and like everything else and so it's like fascinating when like they come down like a community comes down in opposition to something that you would be like oh no you're totally the asshole or like something right or like oh that was totally mm -hmm. fine so right. I think I'm going to I'm going to be the asshole right now and say we have to end on time today because I'm cooking dinner for a bunch of people. So, Daniel, you get the last question today. <laughs> so my my question is just following up on Ben's uh, Twitter exchanges, which is how would you compare your exchanges with Clark with your exchanges with uh, 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 Rick Grinnell on any of the dimensions in this conversation that we have talked about? Well, I would say, uh, so I would evaluate them differently. Um, uh, first of all, um, I was definitely an asshole in my interactions with Jeffrey Clark. Um, but I would say righteously so, because if you um, uh, seek to overthrow the democratic processes of the United States, and then you go on Twitter and boast about it and uh, ask for everybody's congratulations. And you do that knowing that the deputy attorney general 
of the United States in the presence of the president had said to you, you're an environmental lawyer, why don't you go wait in your office and we'll call you when there's an oil spill, that there's a chance that some wag is going to quote that at you. And yeah. if you then respond by saying, Westlaw brims with my cases, which I believe is an exact quote, um, you run the risk that that asshole might mock you. And I, so I'm, I'm deeply apologetic at my uh, uncivil conduct, but I would totally do it again. And, uh, and I, I really don't apologize for it. And I think m making fun of people who are proudly criminals is uh, one of the sovereign prerogatives of philosophers. Um, now, as to Rick Grinnell, um, I have to say I feel an obligation on behalf of two groups of people. One is the nation of Germany, um, and the other is the US intelligence community to mock Rick Grinnell. And I understand that not everybody feels that obligation or thinks that's the highest calling in the world, but I feel like uh, it is my job, just as it's my job to troll the Russian embassy. Uh, Rick Grinnell could easily be the vi next Republican vice presidential nominee. And so I don't think he gets like a, like this is somebody who um, uh, uh, is a, you know, sort of zealot for a bad cause. And I do think we, you know, mockery is one of the ways that we deal with that. So I, I acknowledge that I violate the no assholes rule. <laughs> I don't think it is horrible, however, because I think both are done in defense of democracy. And as Barry Goldwater uh, once said, extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice and therefore not horrible. And uh, moderation, uh, 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 I forget what moderation is no virtue, but the point is you need to send foot picks to Rick Grinnell and that's just the way it works. But like so, all of this is completely meaningless. Like if Barry Goldwater said that, so like if you're Jeff Clark, then you think that like you are saving democracy. Oh, stop with this moral relativism, Kate Klonick. We're out of time. And, uh, you know, so listen, people, don't be horrible and uh, have a great weekend and uh, don't catastrophize things that are merely bad. And uh, we're going to be back on Monday. Uh, Mike Pesca, you're a great American. Kate and and Scott are going to find a guest on Monday, probably a great American. Uh, who knows? They might choose a lousy American. Probably not. Um, a great Scots woman. Who knows? <laughs> it'll be uh, it'll be a bunch of hours and fifty nine minutes from now. And until then, Mike Pesca. Well, we can't have fun anymore, but we can have $50,000 cars with awesome subwoofers. That's, that's I mean, all why? we need. That's literally why. Why would you pay $100 for a haircut, for the love of God? <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'm going to go cook dinner. Kate, uh, uh, I like the haircut. Uh, Thanks. And uh, Mike, I like the haircut, too. Yes. Bye,